Louie, I think this is the beginning of a beautiful friendship. Rose? Where we're going, we don't need Rose. No. I am your father. The greatest trick the devil ever pulled was convincing the world he didn't exist. You're listening to After the Ending, the only film podcast where we tell you what happens after the ending of your favorite films. And now, here are your hosts, Mike Spring and Phil Edwards. Hello, and welcome to After the Ending. I'm Mike Spring. I'm Phil Edwards. And uh, we are feeling festive tonight because here, well, I was about to say here in the U.S. it's almost Christmas, but guess what? It's almost Christmas everywhere yes. in the world. It's just not yeah. one of those holidays that is location-based. Um, but, Phil, you surprised me by putting on your hat right as we were rolling the credits, and I was not prepared. I did not think to have my hat handy because I have a Santa hat, and I don't know where it is. So now I feel like I dropped the ball a little bit. Well, I, I brought it up before, and I was looking around just as the credits started and went, oh, yeah, the hat. So. Well, I'll tell you what. I don't have that, but I am going to put on my sparkly red scarf to look festive. It's not sparkly, but it's red. <laughs> and then there we go. So, ho, 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 ho. I am now fully scarfed. This is actually, it's such a festive scarf, I'll show you. It's, um, I don't know if you can even read it. It's probably backwards, but it's my Red Notice scarf uh, that I got as a promotional item from Netflix for the premiere of. Which which is, of course, one of the Christ most Christmas films Notice. of all time. Oh, for sure. So, yeah. Years. So, it's not particularly uh, uh, Christmassy, but, you know, whatever. It's still red, and it, it matches you now, see? Now yeah. we look, now we're balanced on screen for those people who are watching. So Yeah. I'm watching our viewers just drop as we're sitting here talking about <laughs> scarves and Christmas hats. But um, anyway, uh, we got a jam-packed show for everybody tonight. Um, Phil, you want to tell people what we're what we're talking about? Yes, to, tonight or whenever you're watching or listening to this, we're going to be going after the ending of National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation, mm -hmm. Chevy Chase classic from uh, what year is it? 1989. 1989. Good gosh. Yeah, and we'll also be discussing Spider-Man like we did with June and things like that. We're not going to be having any no spoilers. spoilers. No spoilers for Spider-Man No Way Home because we haven't seen I it. haven't seen it. Nope. nope. It's I'm not going out to yet. see it on Saturday. Right. But we're just going to be talking about how what Spider-Man means to us and what we thought of the other films and comics, video games, bits and pieces like that. Yep. Uh, then we're going to be doing our top five non-Christmas Christmas films. Yes. Or top five yeah. alternative Christmas movies, as yeah. I decided to christen it in the... Um, in the the text because it's easier to type so <laughs> yeah that's it makes most yeah i do not and also be doing our normal uh after the ending recommendations where we talk about anything and everything which uh, we've enjoyed over the past couple of weeks exactly i'll take a quick minute before we get into the episode i just want to show i'm i'm wearing my tribute shirt today from uh, oh, the, yeah. the Monkees 2019 tour that I was lucky enough to see them on. Uh, as I'm sure many people by now know, Mike Nesmith passed away on Friday. Um, he was a personal uh, musical icon hero of mine. I am a huge Monkees fan. Mike Nesmith has been my favorite monkey since I was a kid. And um, actually last year, um, I was lucky enough to have a one-on-one -on -one, uh, Zoom call with him for about 20 minutes um, that my family got me for Christmas because he was offering them through his website. And so I got to have a, a video call just like this where him and I chatted for about 20 minutes. We talked about music. We talked about monkeys. We talked about life in general. Um, and it was an amazing experience. And um, he sounds, his, even though he looks a lot looked a lot older at the time, his voice sounds exactly like the voice that you heard in the monkeys tv show and on the monkeys songs and everything like that so it was a really amazing experience and um he was somebody i've been a fan of my whole life so i was very very sad to hear that he passed away but i wanted to wear my my monkeys shirt my mike nesmith mickey dolan's tour t-shirt in honor of mike um and uh and i hope you rest in peace he was a, a really great uh musical talent a really in, uh, interesting guy yeah he's a legend and he will be missed indeed and i'll just uh how's it doing t-shirts though i'll show you my t-shirt because it's for this evening it sure is, uh <laughs> oh man seriously you spent money on that yeah it's from uh it's from uh last exit to nowhere the t-shirt company they also yep. do some which say die hard is not a christmas movie so whichever one you support well for those of you who are listening phil's t-shirt says die hard is a christmas movie which as any you know well-thinking person knows it clearly is not so <laughs> But we'll get into that, I'm sure, later when we get into our alternative Christmas or non-Christmas Christmas movies list. So, 
Yes, all that's still to come. And yes. as always, if you're watching this live on Facebook, you can leave comments on the post and we'll be able to see them. And we can then respond to them. We can throw them up on the screen. Uh, so just type anything that takes your fancy. Let us know what you think about our endings, Christmas films, Christmas in general, or what, whatever you celebrate this time of the year. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, what your favorite monkey song was or anything, because, you know, like Nesmith, they were legends. Absolutely. Good. Absolutely. Always happy to talk about the monkeys for sure. All right. Well, let's get into our first section here. Our after the ending, we are going after the ending of 1989's National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation. I think it qualifies as a Christmas or holiday classic. Um, so let's uh, let's talk about that. Phil, uh, how do you feel about Christmas Vacation? Oh, I love it. It's one of those ones which it's uh, I, I think it's my favorite out of the vacation films. Hmm. Uh, well, it's the one I've definitely seen the most, anyway. But I just, I just feel it gets everything right. It's a, it's a really good Christmas film. It's a really funny comedy, and it's just one of those ones. Whenever I put it on, guaranteed to laugh within a few minutes of it starting, and just keep laughing all the way through, even though I've seen it umpteen times. Mm -hmm. Loads of great little moments, funny bits. Still quote lots of bits and pieces, even when it's not Christmas. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, great film. I love it. One of Chevy Chase's best performance was uh, as as Griswold. Clark yeah, Griswold. Clark, Clark Griswold, yeah. Yeah, uh, but uh, yeah, I really, really like it. What about you? I, yeah, I mean, I like it a lot as well. It's I have a slightly different experience, I think, than some people do in that, you know, I didn't grow up. I grew up in a, a I guess technically a Jewish household, even though I'm not a religious person. But I so as a kid, I didn't really watch Christmas movies. They weren't on in my house. Uh, so I never got around to seeing National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation until I was an adult. Um, and I and I enjoy it very much. It's a funny movie. We watched it with the kids last year for the first time because they were old enough and, and we all had a good laugh with it. But I don't have that sort of nostalgic um feel for it that a lot of people do you know that sort of like warm christmas glow that you get when you think about watching christmas vacation as a kid like i don't i don't have that um so i kind of have to just appreciate it for its merits as as from the first time i saw it and i like i said i really enjoy it it's very funny um but i don't know it's like is it one of my favorite favorite christmas movies probably not like some of the ones that i grew up with or you know i've seen since but i i, I like it quite a bit it's very funny yeah yeah so That's good. yeah yeah, but it's, yeah it's, it's one of those ones you can just, you know, you can throw on though, and it'll just, it's just going to cheer you up when you see it. We just jokes, yeah. even if it's not to do with Christmas, there's uh, so many different jokes in that thing. Yeah. I, I think it's one, I think it's one of those movies. I've only seen it a handful of times, honestly, uh, at this point, you know, um, maybe three or four times total. But I do think it's one of those ones where every time I watch it, I appreciate it a little bit more. And yeah. so yeah. if, if, you know, we keep watching it with the family and stuff, I think I can see that, you know, down the line, it will be one of my, one of sort of my go to, you know, holiday classics. Um, but, you know, it is a, clearly a very, very well loved film, rightfully so. Um, and it's yeah, it's it's funny stuff. So, yeah, and of course, written uh, by John Hughes. Yep, yep, one of my favorites. Yeah. Um. Up. All right. So, uh, do you want to get into it? Yes. Yeah, sure. Do you want to do want to see what happens in it, or should we just go straight sure to the will. end? Yeah, man, let's do it. So I kept it pretty brief because I figured, like, if you haven't seen Christmas Vacation, first of all, nothing I'm going to do is going to prepare you for it. And second of all, it's not exactly a plot driven movie. So I think this is pretty short. But uh, mm -hmm. Christmas Vacation, 1989, written by John Hughes, as you mentioned, directed by Jeremiah Chechik, um, who I will always remember, directed Benny and June. Don't ask me why. It's just one oh, of those yeah, things. Yeah. Um, but starring Chevy Chase uh chevy chase chevy Ch chevy Ch i never know which way to pronounce his name uh beverly d'angelo and randy quaid so clark griswold just wants to have a nice christmas holiday with his family but everything goes wrong from finding the right tree to putting up the lights to unexpected family showing up to you know people blowing up um and when clark <laughs> finds out that instead of getting a christmas bonus of actual money that he needs for uh, the payment on the pool that he's surprising his family with and is instead getting a membership in the Jelly of the Month Club, uh, he snaps. His cousin Eddie, who's kind of a ne'er-do-well, uh, mm -hmm. goes and kidnaps Clark's boss, which leads to a SWAT team incursion, but they work things out, blow up cousin Eddie's trailer, which sends Santa sailing into the sky, and everybody, SWAT team, family, boss, everyone enjoys a terrific holiday celebration. And that is National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation. How did I do? Excellent, yeah. You've covered everything there. There's... Yeah. yeah, cool. Just imagine that, but there's there's also squirrels in the trees and a snotty dog. Right. Yeah. There's snots, the Rottweiler, and there's the squirrel, and there's the cat, and there's you know the grandpa, and all. Yeah. I mean, it's you yeah. know, yeah, a lot of craziness happening. Yeah, it's uh, it's one of those Christmases where it's great to watch, but you're just glad it's not your Christmas. Yeah, exactly. 
Exactly. All right. Who's up first this week? I think it's me. I think you went first right. last time. Well, I'll let you have it then. Take it away, sir. Okay. Okay. Well, the next morning, Clark woke early and surveyed the mess left from the previous evening's chaos. He was surprised to see that things were not too bad, as the SWAT team had done a bit of tidying up, as had a few of the other people there. He put some coffee on and realized he felt quite relaxed and happy. Ellen, Audrey, and Rusty came down soon after, and the four of them had a quiet, relaxing breakfast. In fact, they were they made no noise at all, as they didn't want to wake any of the, any of the others. So it was lots of almost noises, you know, things always dropping, but lots of being shh and Chevy doing as normal, <gasps> kind of, you know, dropping things and being a bit Chevy chasish. But anyway, just as they finished, they had movements, and they were joined shortly by the rest of the family. Everyone was in fine spirits, and the house was filled with joy and laughter. And once they'd eaten, everybody helped to tidy the rest of the house. Obviously, the burned carpet and furniture had to be moved to the garage, and something had to be done about the remains of uh, the RV that was sat outside. But luckily, the stink had gone <laughs> from the sewage. But then as the day continued, various neighbours knocked to check that everyone was okay as they'd seen the SWAT team the night before and wanted to know what was going on. But some had brought freshly baked cakes and bread. Others had flasks of coffee and hot chocolate. And soon... They, uh, well, they also all agreed that Clark's boss had been an idiot about the bonus. <laughs> but soon more people joined them until a full party was taking place inside and outside the Griswold's house. And it remained so for the rest of that Boxing Day. And everybody eventually thanked Clark and Ellen for the best Boxing Day Christmas they could remember and realized that Clark wasn't actually that bad a neighbor. And that's my after the ending. I like it. Very nice, happy ending, which I think Clark probably deserves, right? Yeah, I thought, give him, you know, give him another day. Right, right, right. That makes sense. And then we get to New Year's Eve and it just goes off again. <laughs> yeah, well, that might uh, that might come into play in my ending. <laughs> <laughs> All right, very nicely done. Excellent. Okay, hit me with yours. All right, here we go. So on New Year's Day, Clark makes a New Year's resolution that from now on, all of his holidays and vacations are going to go perfectly. Unfortunately, things don't go as planned. On Valentine's Day, his romantic extravaganza derails when the bouquet of flowers he brings home for Ellen it turns out to be housing a nest of rare Peruvian moths that multiply quickly and infest the Griswold house. His Valentine's night is spent with uh, Clark and Ellen and the two kids in a one-bed motel room while their house is being fumigated. St. Patrick's Day is a disaster when Cousin Eddie shows up with green beer, but the green in the beer turns out to be algae, sending everyone to the emergency room to get their stomachs pumped. We're not even going to discuss April Fool's Day. Mother's Day brunch is sold out, and the planned Memorial Day barbecue is interrupted by an exploding grill thanks to a faulty propane tank. Father's Day promises to be quiet, but thanks to a mix-up with prescription medicines, Clark spends the entire day unconscious and can't participate in any of the fun family activities that Ellen and the kids had planned. The 4th of July celebration starts out well, but, well, one word, fireworks. Clark enjoys a day off on Labor Day, and the family gets to use the new pool, but a near-drowning incident with Snops the Rottweiler casts a pall on the proceedings. Halloween seemed like a surefire bet, but the moving zombie display that Clark sets up malfunctions and ends up causing an actual zombie panic in the city of Chicago and the surrounding suburbs. By the time the Thanksgiving salmonella incident settles down, Clark has just about given up. But on Christmas Eve, he once again sees what looks like Santa Claus flying overhead, and he, swear he swears he hears Santa say, all is calm, all is bright. So Clark goes inside pours himself a glass of eggnog, settles in with the family by the fire, and has an absolutely perfect Christmas Eve and Christmas Day. And that is the end. Oh, good. As long as he gets as long as he gets at least one day. Well that's what I figured, right? Mm -hmm. Like he's got to go through this year of tumult to get to the one, you know, nice Christmas day. But I felt like he he deserved it. So I had to I had to wrap it up, you know, happily, but I wanted him to go through a little bit of chaos first because it seemed <laughs> <fit. laughs> excellent. So awesome. All right, there you go. So those are our endings for National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation. Let us know what you think happens after the ending or what you think of the movie in the comments if you're watching live or leave a comment in whatever platform you're watching after the fact or listening after the fact in. But let's move on then to our topic of discussion for this episode, which is going to be our spoiler free. We're not even talking about the new movie, but we're going to talk about Spider-Man and the Spider-Man franchise up until now. Does that sound about accurate, Phil? That sounds right, yeah. All right. So um, 
Where do we want to start? I don't know. Where should we start? How do, how do we get into this, Phil? You okay, well, me. well, we won't go. There's the comics. The comics been going for a long time. Yeah. Uh, there's been, uh, but there was, back in 1977, there was the made-for-TV film Spider-Man, which starred Nicholas Hammond. Yep. That led on to a TV show. Yep. And I also, while I was doing this, found out that Nicholas Hammond was one of the Von Trapp kids in The Sound he of was. Music. Maybe. It's funny you mention that because I watched The Sound of Music with my family, um, I don't know, probably sometime last year, earlier this year during the pandemic, and because my, my kids had never seen it. And as I was watching the credits, I saw Nicholas Hammond was um, one of the kids. And as somebody who's been obsessed with Spider-Man pretty much my whole life, I instantly knew, of course, that he played Spider-Man in the TV movies, which I've seen. And so I had to tell my kids, here's some random trivia for you. That kid was Spider-Man, but only sort of because they had never seen those spider man So yeah. anyway, continue. Yeah, I never picked up on it before, but that's uh, that's great. Yeah. Uh, then we had, uh, we, that was back in the 70s. There was a Japanese spin-off in 78. And we then had to wait. In the meantime, there was like various cartoons and bits and pieces. But then it was 1999 that we got... Uh, Spider-Man, uh, the Spider-Man trilogy by Sam Raimi, 2002 to 2007. That was Tobey Maguire. Then we had Mark Webb's Amazing Spider-Man films, uh, 2012 and 2014, starring Andrew Garfield. And then we've had recently Tom Holland as Spider-Man, Peter Parker, who first appeared in 2016's Captain America Civil War. Then we had uh, Spider-Man Homecoming, Far From Home. And now we've got uh, No Way Home, which is due out in the UK tomorrow. Hmm. Oh, you get a day earlier than us, you jerk. Yes, I know. And then we put the, there's also been other various animation shows. We've had, oh, yeah, we've had uh, Spider Man Into the Spider Verse, which featured Shamake Moore as the voice of Miles Morales. And we've had the brilliant PlayStation video game and lots of other video games over the years. But that's that brings us all up to present day. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. None of which answers my question, though, of where do we start? <laughs> well, how do, how do we get into this? <laughs> out, of, out of all of those, which have been your. Which do you feel has been the most accurate Peter Parker and the most accurate Spider-Man? Huh, that's a good question. I think if I'm going for, I mean, in terms of the films, I think actually the most accurate films would probably be the Andrew Garfield ones, the Amazing Spider-Man mm -hmm. uh, films. Um not necessarily my favorite ones, um, not my least favorite either. Uh, I think I'm a little contrary to popular opinion on some of them, but I think he's the one that, that most kind of clearly represented the um, the the the, the Spider-Man from the comics, right? And that Peter Parker is kind of like a, you know, he's like this nerdy, goofy kid, you know, um, but he's not a complete and utter, I don't know, loser, I guess. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, whereas I feel like uh, Tobey Maguire's version of Spider-Man, as I, I've just been watching them recently, the Tobey Maguire movies, and I feel like he's actually like a very perfect version of Archie from the Archie comics. Like Archie is that guy who like step in a paint can and then like as he's trying to shake it off, he'll like knock over a, a, a yes, bookshelf yes. that falls into the next one and so on and so forth. And especially in Spider-Man 2, they really play that up. And I'm like, man, he's really playing Archie really well in the Spider-Man movie. You know, Peter Parker was never like clumsy. Really, he was more of just a science nerd, you know? Um, so yeah, I think our Andrew Garfield's would be maybe my, my, the most accurate for me. How about you? Yeah, I was because I just watched the Amazing Spider-Man just before, and I think I was thinking the same thing. The uh, they really they, they get the, uh, the the intellect of Peter Parker right. I think the most in the uh, in that one, the uh, the Andrew Garfield Spider-Man Peter Parker. Although I think Tom Holland one as well. You do see that a lot as well, considering the school he's in and the, he is working things out and doing stuff, and yeah. you know figuring out all this how to use the Stark tech. But uh, it was the. The Andrew Garfield one, you see him building his own web mm -hmm. shooters and actually doing it. We, I, we sort of jumped all out with Tom Holland a bit, but yeah, I, I know what you mean with the Tobey Maguire, who I did like his his films, but mm -hmm. yeah, he doesn't seem to have the he doesn't seem to have like the the intellect coming through as much of the Peter Parker that we know from the comics. Right, I agree. And I do have a comment here from uh, Christine who says, I love Andrew Garfield, talented actor. I couldn't agree more. I think he is phenomenal in pretty much everything that he's in. I've never seen a bad Andrew Garfield um, uh, uh, performance. So, and I, I do actually really like his Spider-Man movies. Um, okay, well... Um, what about favorites? Let's go. Let's get to right to the good stuff. What's what's your favorite Spider-Man, maybe actor and or Spider-Man film and or trilogy, if we will. We want to look at it that way, even though some of them didn't make it to a full trilogy. Uh, what do you yeah. kind of like? How do you rank them? I kind of think I'm sort of I'm torn between Tom Holland and Andrew Garfield. Mm -hmm. 
I think maybe Tom Holland more because I, I like I think they got his they had him young enough to be like the Peter Parker in high school and it's right. it seemed to be he's been growing and developing and he does it quite he does it really well. I, I think I like I like the way he does it. Uh, then I think Andrew Garfield and then Tobey Maguire. But out of the films, I think I really like the new Marvel ones. Mm -hmm. But I think Homecoming, I prefer Homecoming out of the from uh, Far From Home. But I do like Spider Man 2 still. That's still really solid. But I think mainly because of uh, Alfred Molina as mm -hmm. Doc Ock. Yep, yep. But, and having just watched The Amazing Spider Man, I, uh, I enjoyed that a lot more now than probably than I did the last few times I've watched it. Right. I still haven't watched The Amazing Spider-Man 2 again since that came out, but I remember being really disappointed. Everyone's wrong about that movie. Yeah. But I need to give it another rewatch. But uh, And I really like Spider-Man uh, Spider Into the Spider-Verse. I thought that was great. Yep, yep, yep. Excellent. So, what about you? Um, I, you know, I'm not too dissimilar from that. I, I'm, I'm a big fan of Andrew Garfield's movies. I like Amazing Spider-Man a lot. I think Amazing Spider-Man Two is actually a really good film that everyone hated for no reason whatsoever. Um, and I, I, I actually think I'm probably the biggest proponent of Amazing Spider-Man Two, even though uh, maybe I'll regret that if I go when I go back and rewatch it. But I, I really <laughs> liked it the first time I saw it. So I just don't never understood why people. It's not that I understood, didn't understand why people didn't like it. I get it. Maybe it wasn't the best movie in the world, but like. People like just really it's one of those movies I feel like that internet opinion just took over for everyone. It's like, oh, yeah. well, as soon as it came out, people just started crapping all over it. And then everybody was like, oh, yeah, well, I didn't love it. So you know what? Yeah, it is the worst Spider-Man movie ever made. It's the worst movie ever made. And it's like, I hate when people do that. Like, just have your own opinion, you know? Not saying you you didn't, but like I, I feel like that happens sometimes. Like the internet just sort of amplifies things a little bit. Like, was Amazing Spider-Man 2 really that bad? I personally don't think so, but um, I really like Andrew Garfield a lot. Um, I will say though, if I mean, if I'm ranking the Spider-Man movies, hands down, my number one is Homecoming, which I think is a perfect film, pretty much. Um, I love Tom Holland as Spider-Man. I think his energy is perfect. You know, it's a little bit different of a Peter Parker than from the the comics, which is fine because I understand yeah, they change yeah. things. Um, but I think he's great. I think the movie is perfect. The, I mean, having Michael Keaton as the villain is amazing because Michael Keaton is one of the best actors in the world and can do no wrong, as far as I'm concerned. The scene where they sort of figure out who each other are, you oh, know, in the car. Uh, that's, that's just, in the car is just it's so amazing. Um, I just, I, I really love that movie. I, I think it's phenomenal. Um, yeah, Tobey Maguire actually ranks as my least favorite Spider Man and my least favorite Spider Man movies. Um, I do think Spider Man 2 is, is pretty good. Um, the first one is, I actually rewatched the first one not a couple weeks ago and I thought it, I liked it better this time than I think I ever have before. Uh, even when it first came out and it was a huge, massive hit and I'm a big Spider-Man fan, so I was excited for it. I, I was never overly in love with it. Um, you know, uh, although I also don't think Spider-Man 3 is nearly as bad as everyone says it is. Not that it's great. That's not one that I hold up as a good film, but I also feel like it's it's got plenty of problems, but it's like people hold it up again as like it's the worst film ever. And I'm like, it's it's whatever. It's just, you know. Yeah, I've been seeing lots of things online recently about uh, people going, oh, Spider-Man 3, it's it's brilliant. It's absolutely amazing, blah, blah, blah. I don't know but about then, that either, but. Yeah, it's def definitely not brilliant. But it's, yeah, I don't No, but it's just bad. not, it got such vitriol, you know what I mean? That it's like, it's not, it's just, you know, again, people sort of just let, I think, let let these, these things get amplified to the point where it's like, it's all or nothing. And it's like, you know, it can, you can not like the film, but it doesn't have to be terrible. Like you can just be disappointed in it. Like that's okay. You know, uh, you, or you can say there are parts of it that are good. Cause I think there are some good parts in it, you know, but overall it wasn't great. Yeah, it just yeah, turns but... into, it's the worst movie ever. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but you it's know, uh, yeah, it's some good bits. Tyrannosaurus about critics, uh, it's terrible. <laughs> 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 I just made that up, but I like it. I'm going to use it That's from good. now on. People just Me waving their hands, being like, Rah, "It's awful." <laughs> so, but uh, the very first Spider-Man film, though, I have a soft spot for that though because I saw that with my dad when I was uh, in Peru, mm -hmm. and we saw that in the in a cinema that was built into a cave in the side <laughs> of the cliffs. That's which cool. was amazing. So it was a great great experience because we were doing the Inca Trail as well. But we saw that there. In Lima, so that's I've always it always brings back memories for that. So it's probably sure because of that. But uh, yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, yeah. there's definitely something to be said for the experience of a movie it can change kind of your opinion of the movie itself, you know, without a doubt. So, um, but that's yeah, that's awesome. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I overall I'm definitely a fan of Spider-Man films. Like, I don't think it's like some other franchises where I feel like they've barely ever gotten a good film out of it, or like. You know, you look at like the X Men franchise where there's like you know a dozen films or whatever, and you know most of them are mediocre to 
solid and then there's a couple of standouts i feel like by and large mm-hmm. spider-man movies are pretty enjoyable there's yeah. none that i out and out hate um you know um and homecoming comes pretty close to being the perfect spider-man film so i can't even say like they haven't quite gotten the right spider-man film out you know what i mean um how about let's talk so this is again this is all spoiler free for anybody who's listening neither of us have seen the new spider-man movie because it's not out yet here uh, i'm going to see it on thursday and phil's going to see it on saturday but what are you what are you excited about with the new film, or what are you hoping to see in the new film? Anything particular? Uh, well, it's because I enjoyed Into the Spider Verse, so it's. I was quite surprised to be honest when I re- found out that this next live action one was going to be to do with the multiverse. After that mm-hmm. one did it so well, but maybe that was done so people would be more understanding of the whole multiverse concept. Maybe right. But uh, I'm interested to see what they do with that. Uh, also, because of the things which have been on posters and in trailers. I'm looking forward to see some of those guys coming back. Mm-hmm. Uh, but then there's the other rumors which keep going around, which sometimes I'm going, yes, I would like to see them again. And then other times I'm going, no. Right. I think I'd be perfectly happy if they don't turn up. But if they do turn up, I'll also be going, oh, cool. Uh, but I just want to have a decent story and really just see Peter Parker and Spider Man do things which uh, fit the character. Some great, I want to see some great action scenes, which I think there will be because there have been in all the others. Mm-hmm. I'd like to see maybe uh, Tom Holland's Peter Parker step away a bit more from the shadow of Tony Stark mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, because that's been he's been a big, big part of his life in the Marvel Universe, right? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm just intrigued to see what they do with some of the characters in that are going to be. And I wish they kept, I know it's hard, so hard with the internet now, I wish they kept all the news about the various villains as quiet as they could but i i totally understand what that won't happen yeah i feel like that's sort of one of those things where it's like leak leak some you know leak a few things or let a few things get out there on purpose so you can try and keep some surprises or some maybe some bigger stuff you know what yeah, i mean yeah. um i think yeah i mean i i'm i'm the same way i like i i yeah i would like to see some of the big name people come back that we haven't gotten confirmation of yes or no yet i think that'd be a lot of fun um i worry that the internet as all i'm blaming the internet for a lot of things tonight has built people's expectations up so great that it's like if you don't get every actor who's ever appeared in spider-man movie ever in the history of the world people are going to be like that's, that's terrible why yeah. wasn't tommy mcguire in this why wasn't andrew garfield in this like well they weren't never really supposed to be you know what i mean like that's not a guarantee yeah. Um, so I'm trying to keep my expectations tempered because I don't want it to be a thing that's not, you know what I mean? Um, I do like that Dr. Strange is going to be in it. I'm hoping that that'll be, you know, cause I like Dr. Strange and I haven't seen him in a while. So, um, but yeah, I'm the same way. I just want it to be fun. I just want to, I hope we get some good character moments. You know, like you said, we'll get good action scenes. I hope the multiple multiverse villains and stuff doesn't become too much like we've seen in the past where movies with multiple villains can sometimes suffer so i hope that doesn't become you know a thing um yeah yeah. uh so yeah so we'll see we'll see what happens yeah because that's Um, the interesting thing because spider-man 3 lots of the complaints about that where it's got too had too many villains thrown in yeah and now we've come and also with the the amazing spider-man there was a little bit of uh, the amazing spider-man 2 Mm -hmm. there's a little bit of that as well yeah yeah. So with this one, it seems to have lots of villains in. It looks like, well, as of all the, the superheroes, though, we do know Spider-Man does have the Sinister Six. He often right. faces up against them. So it is workable because he's had lots of stories that way. Yeah, and I think most of them are in this based on what we've seen in the trailers. So that should be mm-hmm. cool to see that. I just hope it's not, you know, I hope it's, I hope they don't feel the need to give all of these villains like equal amounts of screen time. Like it's okay if a couple of them just sort of show up at the end for a big fight or something like yeah, that. You yeah. know what I mean? Like I don't need 20 minutes of the lizard, you know, um, or scorpion, whoever it is, whatever, you know, like I, I'm okay if they just sort of show up at the end. You're like, Oh yeah, I remember him. You know, like I it, certain like Dr. Octopus. Yeah. I like that. He's going to hopefully have some more screen time, you know, but I don't need it to be 20 minutes for each villain. And then we have like a three hour movie where Spider-Man disappears and gets swallowed up. You know, that's, yeah. that's what I'm hoping. But I, I feel like Marvel's earned the benefit of the doubt with that. So I'm going to go ahead and give them, you know, my, my the benefit until I see otherwise, you know? Yeah, I, I totally agree. I think I think it's, well, it's a good way of doing, bringing back some of these these villains who were, have previously just been in one film and then died. Right, right. Yeah. But yeah, uh, exactly. it's also, I, part of me is curious as to whether we'll see Venom show up in some yeah. kind of way. It, or yeah. Morbius, because we've got those those films where we've just yeah. had a Venom film. We've got Morbius coming up. If we're going to see some kind of, even just a mention or a newspaper or something like right. that. 
I see that's the kind of thing where I could see them keeping, you know, a secret. Like if Tom Hardy shows up as Venom for like a decent scene, not just like a cameo, people will lose their minds. You know what I mean? Because like yeah. that's the dream, right? Is to see Spider-Man fighting Venom, you know, and so far they've been separate. So I think people would really love that. But, you know, that's again, I, I'm trying to keep my expectations tempered because it's like, yeah, that would be cool. It sure would. But I don't want to count on it because if it doesn't happen, I don't want it to be like, you know, well, what a letdown, you know? Yeah. yeah but I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing Spider-Man, Doctor Strange, a bit of J. Jonah Jameson. Yeah. And the aftermath of what happened at the end of uh, Far From Home. Yeah. So it's just going to, I'm going to looking forward to see how that's all kind of played out. And yeah, I, I think it's, from uh, some of the reviews which have come out, some of the early reviews, which have all been spoiler free that I've read, but I've been very wary. Mm. And over the next few days, it's going to be a nightmare doing yeah. work online. But anyway, uh, it's it does sound like it's uh, it's a good film anyway, or it's an enjoyable film at the very least. So. Yeah, that seems to be the general um, consensus so far. But, um, you know, I'm I'm just hoping... You know, honestly, that it's the best film of all time. <laughs> no, not really. Uh, it doesn't have to be that. But I hope it's pretty awesome. Definitely. Yeah, so, so everybody there watching and listening, what do you want to see in the new Spider-Man film? Or if you're watching this in a few weeks' time, you can come back to it and say, let us know right. what you thought of it. I got what I messages on the After the Ending Twitter or Facebook or email us and let us know. Was it a hit or miss? There you go. And uh, where can they go after this one? Yeah, we'll have to come right. back and circle around and talk about it again at some point. Probably will. <laughs> All right, there you go. That's going to wrap up our spoiler-free discussion of Spider-Man, uh, the franchise, the character, you know, the, the movies. That. Um, all right, so that is going to bring us to our top five for this episode. Everyone loves our top fives. And tonight, well, Phil, this is your idea. So I'm going to let you tell people what, what our top five is and explain it, because I needed you to explain it to me. So you explain it to them. My idea. Well, first of all, I'm yeah. going to have to take this hat off because it's getting really itchy. <laughs> so it's, it's still Christmas. Yeah, no, I know the scarf isn't going to last too long either. But now that you took the hat off, I'm taking, I'm taking the scarf. Off. I've got, I've got solidarity, there. brother. Solidarity. Yeah. Oof. It's actually oh, surprisingly warm for being kind of thin. Actually, I've got a red, red forehead now. No, look okay. Now it's the Z scarf. Sorry. <laughs> anyway. Yes. Yeah, so, so as, no. as Sorry, well, go ahead. Uh, we. Don't we mind me. The next episode's coming up. There's a few messages to and throw going. What are we going to do this time? And it was coming up to Christmas and it has the usual discussion I, I saw starting to surface on the internet about is Die Hard a Christmas film? And then you realize, you know, it's it's not it's not Christmas season until there's an argument about Die Hard. So I thought <laughs> to say, I messaged Mike and said, why don't we do our top five non-Christmas Christmas films? And Mike went, what? Right. And I went... You know, alternative Christmas films are the ones which aren't necessarily a Christmas film, but we watch at Christmas time. Some right, of them which... might have elements of Christmas in, or some of them might have no Christmas elements in. Some of them might just be very personal to a person, but they watch it at Christmas time because they watched it with a significant other at some point in their life. But that's what I thought we'd do. But right. as I said, uh, sure. To which I replied, um, I don't do that. Yes, yes, I know, Phil. Your shirt says Die Hard is a Christmas film. Very nice. Right. Yeah, I know. Why did you mention that again? Um, I replied, I don't I don't do that. I don't I don't have any films that I watch at this time of year that aren't Christmas films. The only films that we watch regularly at Christmas time are Elf, Miracle on 34th Street, and It's a Wonderful Life. And then I watch a bunch of Hallmark Christmas movies. Um, the rest of I don't have thing. anything else. So I'm like, why are we doing this? And Phil was like, just shut up and do it. No. Um, <laughs> but uh, I was like, all right. I'm, no, I, I typed that. I don't... Type it. All, all capital saying, just do it. Yeah. yeah. I don't know that my list is going to um, blow anybody's mind. Um, and I don't know that it's entirely the spirit in which it's intended. But I don't really care because it's your list. So <laughs> I'm just going to do what I'm going to do. How's that sound? It's the end of your shenanigans. That's right. <laughs> All right, so this is our top five uh, non-Christmas Christmas movies or alternative Christmas movies, uh, movies that maybe you watch at Christmas time, I guess, if you're, I don't know, it's weird to me. I watch Christmas movies at Christmas time if I'm going to watch, I watch non-Christmas movies at Christmas time too, but I don't watch them because it's Christmas time. I just watch them because I want to watch a movie. Like, you know, I just watched um, The Iger Sanction with Clint Eastwood from the 1970s. Ooh, yeah. not, it's not a Christmas movie. I just wanted to watch it and it was on one of the streaming services. So I watched it. Super problematic, by the way. 1970s, very non-PC. Holy cow. Can't yeah, think of a minority that wasn't ins insulted in that movie. But that's neither here nor there. My point is, I don't, I don't do this, but I'm going to do it anyway. So 
So, Phil, I'm going to let you start this week then because <laughs> it's your list. Okay. Well, uh, number one. No, number one, number five. Number one, number five. Jumping That's ahead there. Number, number five is uh, it's from 1987, and it's written by Shane Black, and we'll have more of him on this list because he does seem to like Christmas an awful lot, but he it sure is does. Lethal Weapon. Sorry, by Richard Donner, which is set at Christmas. There's Christmas trees. There's Christmas music. There's fights at Christmas time. There's people saying, I'm too old for this stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, yeah, I, I enjoyed the, the, the fight in the, the Christmas tree place. What do you call it? Mm-hmm. Place we get Christmas trees from. Yeah, there's a word for it, but it's gone. Anyway, but, yeah, that's it's my number five because it's uh, it's some good action. It's got... Mel Gibson and Danny Glover back in their prime. It's got Gary Busey before he went totally up there. And, uh, yeah, I, I really dig it. I like. I always like having a bit of action in some of my scene in my films, especially around about Christmas time, because lots of the Christmas ones do get a bit maudlin and a bit uh, sickly sentimental in places, and I do like a bit of a change-up from that now and again. Sure. That's my number five. All right, so here's my question, because this is why I hate the Internet. So why... Is Die Hard a Christmas movie, according to everybody on the internet, right? Or there's always these debates about Die Hard, but not Lethal Weapon. There's just as much Christmas in Lethal Weapon as there is in Die Hard. Why is it that everyone settled on Die Hard being a Christmas movie? Is it because they really think it's a Christmas movie? Or is it because the internet said, hey, you know what would be cool? Let's decide that Die Die Hard's a Christmas movie. And everyone was like, yeah, yeah, I'm going to do that. And I'm going to be neat and I'm going to be fun and cool and original by picking Die Hard as my favorite Christmas movie, even though everyone else is doing it. And I just got it from the internet. A serious question, though, yeah, in there I, somewhere, I, I, which I is why uh, is not Lethal Weapon now considered a Christmas movie just like Die Hard is? They're the exact same amount of Christmas in them. No, it's not. I think uh, Die Hard's got a lot more Christmas because it's all set on Christmas Eve. It's got uh, it's got a man crawling around chimneys, making a list and checking it twice. That's a stretch. It, it's full. It's full of That's Christmas songs. Full of Christmas music all the way through, more than lots of these other films do, and. Uh, it's got a it's got a bad guy who's a bit like the Grinch, uh, and it's got a it's got a good a good man like uh, George Bailey trying to you know do right for his family. Okay, whatever you say. All right. So, so wrong my chair, Mike. It keeps just rising up. What? Oh yeah. You know what? As Bruce Willis himself said, Die Hard is not a Christmas movie. Die Hard is a Bruce Willis movie. Yeah. Yeah. So there. End of story. Problem solved. It's no longer a debate. Okay, what's your number five? All right, my number five is uh, Gremlins. Um, because it takes place at Christmas. And I figured that fits because I don't, you know, whatever. Um, it's Gremlins. It's great. It's fun. It has Gremlins in it. It takes place at Christmas time. There's lots of Christmas stuff in it. Yet still, no one's arguing that Gremlins is a Christmas movie, even though it's more of a Christmas movie than Die Hard is. Um, so again, I point to the hypocrisy of the entire argument, but, uh, yeah, that's my number five gremlins. Yeah. It also has a very happy story about, uh, about her mom, about her dad. Yeah. When he, exactly. That's the, my funny favorite part of the movie. I do like that bit. That always makes me. Yeah. That's actually my favorite part of the movie is the second one where they revisit that joke with the Abraham Lincoln thing. That's hysterical. Um, but anyway, uh, okay. So there we go. Gremlins is my number five. Oh, and also, though, for people who want to listen to what we thought happened after the ending of Lethal Weapon, we did after the fourth, four films? Yeah, four. Yeah, way back in episode 114, we did that. And for Gremlins 2, we went even further back. That was back in episode 58, if you want to go back and see what we thought happened then. All right, I like it. Okay. I think you mentioned Elf as well. We did that in episode 36. Yeah. And who knows what we talked about then, because I've got no clue. (laughs) Anyway, okay. My number four, four, yeah, yeah. My number four is uh, some superhero action with Batman Returns, mm. which has got uh, Tim Burton's styling all over it because it was the second one he did. I wish we'd had some more, but I do like Tim Burton's designs and things, and we we saw some more of them in uh, Nightmare Before Christmas, even though he just did lots of design wrecks. Uh, but uh, this one I, I I really like anyway. Um, mainly because Michelle Pfeiffer's Catwoman is just brilliant and Danny DeVito's Penguin is just disgusting. But I, I do like the whole thing. It, it's uh, it's set at Christmas time. We have a bit of action. I just wish wish we could have had a bit more 
of uh, Michael Keaton being able to move his neck. I would have been a bit more, a bit more fun. But we have we have presents. We have we have killer clowns. We have penguins with rocket launchers, and you can't get more Christmassy than that. Right. Yeah. What, sure. What do you think? What do you think it's going to be like? The uh, the Flash might have Michael Keaton back in the cow. Do you think it's going to work? I I think it will if they're because they're having aren't they having him play Thomas Wayne, who's the older Batman anyway, because he's Bruce's dad. Yeah, there's rumors, rumors about that's, that. Yeah. That's what I think it's supposed to be, and that that works for me. If they're doing him yeah, playing yeah. like the older Batman, I'm down with that. I don't think he's going to be. I think he's meant to be sort of the grizzled veteran Batman, not the like young spry Batman. So I think I think it could be pretty cool. Again, in my opinion, Michael Keaton can do no wrong. So if he's yeah, doing it, I think it's going to be um, pretty awesome. So fingers crossed. Good stuff. Yeah. Okay. What's your next one? All right. My number four. Uh, well, it's already appeared on your list. It's Lethal Weapon um, because I love Lethal Weapon. And, you know, it's funny. I just watched it uh, in the summertime because it's not a Christmas movie and I just wanted to watch <laughs> Lethal Weapon. Um, so, you know, but it's great and I love it. <laughs> I like all the Lethal Weapon movies. Um, but you're right. Shane Black does enjoy his Christmas uh, themes for whatever reason. Um, so, yeah, Lethal Weapon. If you're going to I guess if you're going to watch a non Christmas movie at Christmas time that sort of has Christmassy stuff in it. You can't do much better than than that. So that's my number four, Lethal Weapon. Just so I just I was just looking. Yes, yeah, so many of his films at the Christmas time. Yeah, right. Yeah. Okay. Figure. My next one is uh it's another Shane Black one. Mm-hmm. Which I rewatched last night or the night before. Uh, it's Kiss Kiss Bang Bang, uh, a great black comedy crime thriller set at Christmas starring uh Robert Downey Jr. who Later went on to work with Shane Black in uh, Iron Man Three, mm-hmm. and did these some girls. But it's a uh, it's a good one. It's a murder mystery set in and around Los Angeles uh, during Christmas time, which always I always find it weird. Anyway, when it says uh, you have films set at Christmas time in LA because it's the same weather all the time, right? Which and I've just being in the UK with our weather, it just blows my mind having like christmas time and things like that in the blazing hot sun i recently watched uh bosch and having like moments some of the scenes some of the scenes during uh, christmas there didn't even know it was a christmas episode in bosch until he goes into a bar and there's like it's playing christmas music and there's lights and it's going oh it's the exact same weather every day i mean i know your side uh, the east coast gets even more winter weather than we do over here but uh, oh, yeah yeah, but uh, Kiss Kiss Bang Bang, it's lots of fun. If you haven't seen it, check it out. It's got a great one by, great performance by Val Kilmer. Uh, and there's just lots of Christmas parties, Christmas festivities, people dressed up in Santa outfits and things like that. That's my Very number good. three. So Kiss Kiss Bang Bang didn't make my list uh, largely because I actually still have never seen it. It is one of those movies I have been wanting to see for a long time, and I just never seem to... Um, come across it in a way that is convenient for me to watch it. And so I've just never watched it yet. And I key, I really want to. And I actually, when I was looking at stuff for this list and I saw that one on there, I was like, dang it, I've still never seen Kiss Kiss Bang Bang. I'm like, you know what? I'm watching it. This this Christmas break when I'm off of work, I'm going to, I'm going to, if I have to rent it, I don't care, whatever. I'm going to make the time and, and watch it. Because I know it's a very well-loved film. So yeah, I just yeah. need to finally sit down and watch it. But I've, I've got it on Blu-ray, but I watched it yesterday because I was just flicking through uh, Amazon Prime Video. And it was on there, so I, that's how you in the UK. So I don't know what it's like over at yours, but right, it must be on a streaming service. Even if I yeah. have to pay, even if they rent it, I don't. You know, I'll I'll track it down. So that's why I think I've been. Well, I never got a review copy when it came out originally, so I didn't watch it that way. And then I've been sort of waiting for it to pop up on a streaming service for free. And I guess either it hasn't, or I've missed it, or whatever. I don't know. But now I'm just gonna I'm just gonna shell out the four bucks, yeah, and watch it. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna go crazy. All right, uh, my number three um is uh my favorite christmas movie ever uh it is first blood also known as rambo first blood um because much like die hard it's a christmas movie um it takes place at christmas time there's christmas trees everywhere and um you know it's about uh, a lone guy walking into um a strange town and preaching I don't know. I'm making stuff up now. It just wants to be left alone, just like Jesus, I guess. I don't know. Um, but yeah, it's. Uh, I love First Blood. It's a great movie. And I was um, when I watched it again, not at Christmas time, um, a year or two ago. Uh, I was um, 
I was like, hey, there's a lot of Christmas stuff in this movie. It takes place at Christmas time. There's the whole sheriff's office that he destroys is all decorated in Christmas stuff. And I was like, all right. So if you want, like, if it's Christmas time, and you want something semi Christmasy theme, but you want just a really kick ass action film, um, First Blood is an amazing, amazing movie. Um, and I recommend it very highly. So that's my number three, First Blood. Totally agree. That's a, it's a brilliant movie, that. And it's, it's uh, it just gets better every time I see it. Absolutely. I agree. It's really, and if, really if good. you're a person who's like sort of not never watched it and you're going, oh, it's a bit, don't want any of that over top, you know, or muscles and guns. The first one, First Blood, is, is not like that. I mean, obviously, right. guns and stuff, but it's, it's, it's a very good story about a Vietnam vet suffering from PTSD and just the way he was treated. Yeah. By, yeah. Uh, it, it, the franchise doesn't really go over the top until the second one, until Rambo. The first one is a really solid kind of man against the world action movie, um, with a good amount of drama in it too. It's 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 pretty phenomenal. I love it. Yeah, it's, and it's one of those ones I didn't really think of it at all as a Christmas. I didn't even realize it was set at Christmas because I hadn't seen it for a while, and then it popped up on some lists. And then watching it again, I think over summer as well, going, oh yeah, I'd forgotten all about that bit, bits and pieces. But yeah, yeah it's uh, Stallone is just brilliant in it, and Brian as is Brian Dennehy. Yes, yes. Okay, well, my number two is uh, from 1983. It's uh, directed by John Landis, and it's Trading Places. Dan Aykroyd and Eddie Murphy, Trading Places. Uh, but set <laughs> yeah. on Christmas, and as Dan Aykroyd slowly loses all his riches uh, and his, the respect he had from his peers, he ends up putting on a Santa suit, going to a Christmas party, and absolutely ruining it, ruining it but, which probably happens at many Christmas parties, <laughs> but probably not to the extent as it does in Trading Places. But we then go on after Christmas as well. It does go on to New Year's Eve. Uh, and we then still have the bit talking about frozen orange juice prices, which I still never quite get. But anyway, they save the day and end up on a lovely tropical beach. But it's uh, it's set mainly set at Christmas time. Lots of snowy scenes in uh, New York. And it's just lots of fun. And it's uh, one I've... I don't think I actually own it yet, so I haven't watched it yet. So I need to get that. Which back. is funny because they Paramount puts that movie out on home video like at least once a year. Like it's yeah. one of their best catalog titles. I can't tell you how many different versions of it I've gotten to review. It's like Trading Places on DVD, Trading Places on Blu-ray, Trading Places 20th Anniversary Edition, Trading Places, the Trading Places version, Trading Places Special Edition. Like it's like they just keep Trading Places Steel Bookcase Edition. Like they just keep repackaging it over and over and over again. It is it is amazing that of all the films not to have, that's one of them because you can, they're literally a dime a dozen. I must, I did have it on VHS, but I just, I'm sure I must have had it on DVD. Right. I don't, I don't know what happened to my copy of it. But yeah, as you say, there's always been re released. Just yeah. seen here as well, it was going to be originally, it was developed originally for Project to Star Richard Pryor and Gene Wilder. Who I, mm, I can see that. that. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. That's uh, my number two. All right. Very good. Okay. Well, my number two. Um, I think maybe I finally got in the spirit of things here a little bit, um, but it is a film from 2016 called Better Watch Out. Um, it's actually kind of a like horror slash psychological thriller movie, but um, it is set at Christmas time and it's kind of like, in a way, it's like a, a darker, more twisted version of Home Alone. Um, sort of. So basically what happens oh, okay. is Levi Miller, who is a young actor, he's been in a bunch of stuff, big big name movies, like none of which I can think of off the top of my head. I, um, uh, but he's a really talented young actor. He plays uh, this like 12-year-old kid and his babysitter is like 17 and she's over at Christmas time and um, she's babysitting him and he's kind of in love with her. So he tries to get her interested in him and there's like sort of like a home invasion. They do some things like directly related to, or even like spoofing home alone, like in terms of like, Hey, here's what really happens when you get hit in the head with a can of paint, right. Or thing or a baseball <laughs> bat or things like that. So it's kind of like, a. it's a really hard film to describe, especially without giving away some of the twists and turns, but it's kind of a home invasion, black comedy, thriller, horror, slasher, Christmas, movie ish okay that, yeah yeah, yeah. Um, i know the one i know the one you mean now i remember the trailer it's one of those ones i'm meant to watch but I've just yeah i really like it it's not it's not super christmasy in that it's not like christmas isn't really the point of the movie it just takes place at christmas time and there's some some stuff with i think I, if i've been i've only seen it since it, when it came out and maybe tying people up with christmas lights or things like that but it definitely christmas is all around the film because everything's decorated there's presents and trees and stuff like that um but it's obviously not a christmas movie because you know it's it's this more of this this home invasion kind of thriller type thing it's like the strangers but if it was funnier 
and like the strangers meets home alone maybe like a mashup of those two movies i don't know if that makes okay, any yeah. sense at all but i liked it i liked it a lot it's a good fun film uh definitely if you want something a little bit different to watch at christmas time that still has a slightly christmasy theme to it or a christmas imagery at least uh better watch out is, is definitely worth tracking down okay okay yeah it's one of them i have to say that's streaming somewhere yeah yeah because i do like there are lots of uh christmas set horror movies as well which Right. This is another another list entirely. We'll have to do that next year. Yep. Yeah. But uh, okay. Well, my number one was going to be Die Hard, but as it's a Christmas movie, it doesn't apply. <laughs> so God. instead, it's okay. This one. Hang on. I I can't. I I just I because this what drives me nuts. Let me ask you this: Before the internet existed, do you ever remember ever 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 anybody ever calling Die Hard a Christmas movie? Ever once. Before the internet existed, yeah, no, yeah, nobody ever talked about whether Die Hard was a Christmas movie before the internet existed or not. No, we, we, we did over here, Mike. You just you no, there, you but... are you are telling stories out of school, my friend. I do not believe you because it never happened. It's, it is not a Christmas film, but I'm serious. D d did people talk about that before the internet? In the 10 years after Die Hard came out, when all of the sequels were coming out, did anybody ever say, oh, how come Die Hard 2 isn't a Christmas movie like Die Hard is? Oh, Die Hard 3 takes place in the summer in New York, but it's not. Would, I'm surprised they didn't make it a Christmas movie like the first film. Did anybody ever have that conversation ever? That's an excellent point, actually. I can't remember. No, they didn't because Die Hard's not a Christmas movie and nobody ever thought of it as such. It's Then the internet comes out and is like, Die Hard's a Christmas movie. And everyone's like, yeah, I'm going to run with that. That's my number one argument as to why Die Hard isn't a Christmas movie. That's yeah, that's an interesting one. That's a good. That's like that's a valid argument. Thank you very much. Yeah, I, yeah. I am as I have a friend of mine who finds me fascinating because he disagrees with almost all of my opinions. But he says, but what I love about your your opinions is that even if you are you take the most unpopular stance in the world, you always have a good reason for backing it up. Yeah, and that's I as long as you've got a, a reason theory. and it's uh, it's not harming anyone. Yeah, I don't think I'm harming anybody with my opinions. No, no, but, uh, some people on the internet do. Well, yeah, I don't. I don't do it that way. I just, yeah, yeah. I just, I have very logical arguments for why I like or hate things, and I feel very strongly about them. So, anyway, you ponder that for a while, and now go ahead and tell us your number one. My number one is a controversial one, maybe, but okay. it is. A, it's a Wonderful Life. Okay, I struggle with this one a little bit actually, so I'm glad you mentioned it mm, because if Die Hard is a Christmas movie. I'd set at Christmas Eve. It's all Christmas themed. There's Christmas music all the way through. It's a Wonderful Life, which is always like in all the Christmas list. People, say, we also went after the ending way back in episode 36, mm -hmm. Double Bill with Elf. If you want to listen to that, but the 1946 drama by Frank Capra has very little Christmas in it when right. you actually think about it. Right. It's, uh, what's it got? It made some notes. It's got a four minute opening credits with Clarence talking to the angels. And we see a little bit of Christmas, but then it's an hour and 12 minutes of George Bailey's life, mm -hmm. none of which is set at Christmas. Then there's a bit more set at Christmas and about that. But it's all basically about how a banker wins and gets all the money from the town. And a man is told to, you know, stay in his place and be happy with what he's got. And don't dream about ever getting anywhere else in life. It's quite depressing, but it's a brilliant film and one I watch most Christmases. But it's uh, it's my number one because if you can argue that Die Hard is a Christmas film, you can also e equally argue that It's a Wonderful Life is not a Christmas film. I, because... I yeah, I get where you're coming from on that actually, and it's funny because a, a couple of years ago I saw something, it was an article or something about how it's not really a Christmas film, and I was like, what are you talking about? Of course it's a Christmas film. And then for all the reasons you just said, you could argue that it's not. But here's why I ultimately came down on the side of it being a Christmas film or it's not the Christmasiest of Christmas films, right? Yeah, you know what I'm yeah, saying? Like, yeah. to me, it's not like Miracle on 34th Street is to me like a true Christmas movie, right? Um, because to me, a Christmas movie is kind of about Christmas, right? So in that in that sense, you could say that It's a Wonderful Life isn't really a Christmas movie, right? But the way I look at it is it's about this man and his, like you said, being thankful for what he's got, but his, it's about his family and his love for his family and how important that is and how the culmination of all of this stuff in his life leads up to the scene that takes place on Christmas 
and the whole angel gets its wings with the bell ringing with the Christmas tree and all of that stuff. It it's so it's not a full Christmas movie the whole way throughout, but it uses Christmas yeah. as sort of the inciting incident in a way that leads to this whole journey um, that sort of, again, culminates on Christmas. So to me, I feel like that's a good enough reason to watch it at Christmas time. You know what I'm saying? And to consider yeah, yeah, it's totally, movie. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's not maybe about Christmas in the most strictest sense, but like Die Hard is about shooting terrorists, right? It has nothing to do with Christmas. This at least is about family and love and very Christmas related things. And saving his wife, who's called Holly. Pish Tosh is what I have to say to that. Right. Oh, and and you're right. And also that tie in there is I'm pretty sure that one of the terrorists who threatened to kill baby Jesus was named Hans Gruber back in ancient times as well. Right. So apparently you know, that was a lost segment, a lost passage. Yeah. I mean, that that is right straight out of the Bible. So, mm -hmm. you know, um, yeah. right. But OK, very good. Um, uh, my number one film is not Die Hard either, not because it's. A Christmas movie um, because I just didn't want to die hard anywhere near this list because it has nothing to do with Christmas. But uh, <laughs> so my number one actually doesn't have to do with Christmas, but I thought that was OK because this is alternative Christmas movie, Christmas movie. Yeah, totally, yeah. Um, but it's it fits the theme, though. It is frozen, but not Elsa and Olaf and all of them. It is the 2010 Frozen. Uh, it is a thriller by Adam Green, who's best known for the Hatchet movies. I've talked about this film a few times before on the show. Um, basically, it's a, a very simple plot. It's three like teenagers or young adults. Um, they sneak onto a ski lift. The ski lift shuts down while they're halfway out and they're stuck hanging you know, 300 feet in the air in over the, a long holiday weekend with temperatures dropping. And that's the plot. And that's all I'm going to say about it. Um, but it's snowy. It's covered in snow. It obviously takes place in the winter time, right? If you want to watch a really great movie at Christmas time, that's not a Christmas movie, but fits in with like, you know, cause there's snow everywhere yeah. and the weather and everyone's bundled up and everything. It kind of fits the mood and the vibe um, of the season, at least the physical season, not the Christmas season, but the physical season of winter. Um, I think you can't do better than frozen because it's just an absolutely amazing, amazing film. It is a tense, taut, exciting thriller. Um, I love it to death. And as I've mentioned a few times before, um, if you get the home video, blue, I, I think the Blu-ray, I don't know about the DVD, but there's a feature length documentary that's as long as the movie that is every bit as good as the movie about making the film, um, which is like, you get like two for one. So, um, but I love this movie Frozen. Not, again, not the animated one. Um, and if you want something a little different for Christmas, but it still is going to, you know, look cold and snowy and Christmassy, um, Frozen is it. So that's my number one. Does that, does that work, Phil? That's that a good okay? call. Does work. Yeah, it's a very good film, though. Yeah. It's, uh, I, I always forget it. about that film. It's such, a, I never do. That's the thing. It's, it's one of those weird movies that, like, you know, it's been, it's 11 years now, it's been out. And it's just like, I, it comes, pops into my head, uh, you know. Every so often, every time I look at a, like a list or whatever or something like that, I'm like, oh, can Frozen fit on this? Like, it's just always a movie that I want to tell people about and get more people to watch because I love it. Excellent. Um, um, and has uh, Sean Ashmore in it, who I love. And he's super, super nice because I've met him twice in New York Comic Con. And he's always one of the nicest guys. So, Brilliant. Um, while, while we've been there, good pick that one, by the way. But uh, while we were doing this, I just remembered there was another film, which is, is a Christmas movie. It was by Walt Disney. Uh, and I remember watching it. And it absolutely destroyed me. It's One Magic Christmas, starring Mary Steenburgen and Harry Dean Stanton. Harry Dean Stanton's an angel sent by uh, Father Christmas, Santa Claus, to restore the Christmas spirit of Mary Steenburgen's. I and mean, he basically does that by making her whole life go to crap. Oh, wow. And I just remember watching going, what's going <laughs> on? Right. And going, oh, my, no, stop this. And it's just, right. just when things couldn't get any worse, they do a little bit more worse until things, would I, oh, yeah. Wow. Yeah, One Magic Christmas from 1985. I am not even remotely familiar with that movie, actually. I have to, I have to admit. So yeah. Harry um, Dean Stanton basically sits in a tree a lot playing harmonica. Okay. Well, that now you've sold me. You know, you, you give me that. How can I not rush out and watch? Maybe instead of Kiss Kiss Bang Bang, I'm going to rush out and rent uh, this horribly depressing movie you just told me about with yeah. Harry Dean Stanton playing the harmonica. There you go. But uh, <laughs> well, that, that's our lists of non Christmas, Christmas movies, alternative Christmas movies, yep. what have you. There you but go. Let us know what films you like watching, which aren't necessarily Christmas films, and let us know where you fall on the whole Die Hard thing. Yes, um, if you agree, you if you agree that Die Hard is not a Christmas movie, let us know. And if you think Die Hard is a Christmas movie, um, keep it to yourself. <laughs> but let us know of any other films which you watch at Christmas time. Which, yes, that I'll be curious to hear. I would yeah, like which to other hear people don't want, really watch or go. 
when you tell them you're watching it, they go, why, what? That's going to do Christmas. But yeah, let us know in the comments as and where you're watching or listening to this. Yeah, I would like to hear, you know, what are some things, what are some some kind of alternative Christmas movies that people watch regularly, maybe at Christmas time, even if they're not Christmassy or whatever, you know, because um, I'm curious to see what other people think about about these. So, all right, good lists. Nicely done, Phil. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. All right. Well, that's going to bring us to our final section of the show, which is ATE Recommends, where Phil and I share something we are digging right now, whether it is uh, movie related or books or comics or games or music or anything it could be. So um, I think I've made you go twice first tonight, I think, Phil. So I, I should probably leave. Okay. Yeah. You go first. Uh, let me get it. I left it just a little bit too far out of reach. Oh, let me put the solo mode on here on the video for those of you watching so you can see it just a little bit better. All right, so here's my recommendation this week. It is the art of the Walking Dead universe. It is a giant, chunky, thick coffee table book um, that it ostensibly it is like production art and um, photos and things like that from all three Walking Dead TV shows, the, the Walking Dead, Fear of the Walking Dead, and whatever the other one is, the new world or something like that. Yeah, the one that nobody likes. That. Um, but honestly, the other two shows are like just kind of thrown in as an afterthought. It's really 90% like walking dead stuff. But what's cool about it is I'm going to try and do this, but it's got like, you'll see like there's like production notes. There's like, like, you know, designs like architecture designs. There's like things about like their weapons and like, um, there's oh, that's interesting. Feel. Yeah. It's got a lot of photos, but it's also got a lot of artwork. Um, you know, behind the scenes stuff, you know, uh, storyboards, pro co concept art. And then my favorite part actually is here at the back. There's a pretty sizable gallery of um, uh, like promotional artwork, like posters and like, you know, things from like, you know, trading cards yeah. and like ads for the show. Um, really great. Some graphic design stuff, you know, just really, really. I mean, look at all these like, you know, just uh, every like ad they design for the show and things like that so it's a very comprehensive book a lot of text it's not one of those photo only books but it's also oh, the right great. amount where you not you're not reading a novel either you know what i mean so you can mostly go through and look at the pictures and then there's like you know little little paragraphs or captions about each one that you yeah, yeah. So it's a beautiful book great cover art um and actually there's even an exclusive version i think you can get online um i got i happen to get both but uh, the, there's a reason for that but um uh let's just say there's some some perks to my um you know reviewing things and my upcoming gift guide feature but there's actually an exclusive cover um as oh, well nice. available so this is david finch who's a superstar comic book artist he's been he did a series of these half human half zombie drawings for the second prints of the walking dead reprint series and because daryl's not in the comics he didn't do one for that so they got oh, him to yeah, do an yeah. exclusive one for the cover of the um of the book as an exclusive. I think you have to order it through the Skybound website to get this version. But anyway, it's a great book if you're a Walking Dead fan. Really, really cool. Um, I guess just as Christmassy as other things like Die Hard. Um, no, I'm sorry, <laughs> that one I'm kidding on. But um, uh, it's really, really, if you like I said, if you, even if you're not a, like I'm not still the current Walking Dead watcher, but I, you know, I watched it for like nine seasons. Um, you know, I still have a lot of uh, appreciation for the show. Um, it's just a, it's just a really great like visual compendium of, of the show so like i said even if you're not watching it you can just still enjoy looking at all the great details in the production and the artwork and the you know the galleries and stuff like that so that's my recommendation this week uh, look, yeah it looks very good i mean i tapped out of the walking dead tv show two or three seasons in even though i love mm. the comic but that did just flicking through it it did look really interesting yeah, it's, and fascinating it's a nice book. Stuff, yeah. yeah okay well i've got two recommendations one is a board game and it is awesome. called oops, a bit heavy maglev metro Okay. By Ted Alspec, uh, published Me. by Bezier Games, but it's a great one with a uh, oh, upside Your down. Your back is upside down. There you go. Yeah. It has uh, cool. you're basically building uh, a, well a maglev, a kind of a magnetic railway through New York or Berlin on a double sided map, and you've got to use robots to to basically build a. It's like an engine building game where you mm -hmm. get you get more robots so you can do more things so you can then build stations and build tracks. So then you can pick up passengers who then open up more abilities and you get your engine working well. But it's just, it's a really good game, but it's the the components of it are just absolutely beautiful. You have the tracks for each player on these transparent uh, discs and mm -hmm. you can overlay uh, the discs over other players' ones so you can have tracks going side by side and then going off in different ways. 
it's just it's a beautiful game well designed well thought out i've only played it the once i'm looking forward to playing it more because there's so much strategy so much, and so many other different things you can do i've barely scratched the surface but it's one of those ones once i finished playing well even part way through go i was going oh if i'd done this at the start this would be where right. it and so right. on like that but it's I've also only played a two player, but looking forward to playing it with the, the maximum of four. Just cool. to see what that's like. And it takes about an hour and 90 minutes to play. Obviously, it took a bit longer for my first game, but that's sure. right. Maglev Metro. Very cool. I think there's an expansion coming out in 2022 as well. Nice. And then my other one is uh well, it's a collection of four graphic novels. But uh Mike, I know you like this because I got them in New York Comic Con when I was there with you, but it's silver. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Steve, Stephen Frank, which has got In... beautiful, beautiful black and white artwork all the way through. These are just covers. Mm -hmm. It's just, uh, just yeah. great, stylish, very lots of different things. But it's it's all about, it's set in the 30s, if I'm right. Something like that, yeah. Yeah, 1930s. And it's all about a con man getting a crew together to go and rob Dracula's castle. Mm -hmm. And that's all I'm going to say. <laughs> but it's got it's got great moments, great scenes. I hope one day the film that's being written does actually see the light of day. Yeah. But uh, as I say, I got them over in uh, New York Comic Con where I spoke to Stephen Frank and he very kindly signed them. But it's well worth you picking up and checking them out. Is there? A, there's four volumes. The whole story. Uh, yeah, it so is. That is the whole story. And I don't think they've com collected them into a, a big compendium yet, although I could be wrong on that. But yeah, that's the whole thing. So you can definitely, um, you know, pick that up and, and read the whole thing. And I, I will definitely agree with you. As you know, Phil, I'm, I recommended it to you. Um, and I'm glad that you enjoyed it. But it's it's terrific stuff. And the artwork is just amazing. Yeah, for sure. Um, did you know I was watching just the other night, um, a show, uh, Marvel's What If, and Stephen Frank is the animation supervisor on on what if oh yes yeah which is probably why it looks so good he was an animator first and then he got into doing some of these comics That's um, right, yeah. and so when i saw his name i was like well that makes sense they went to because he had worked on some pretty high profile projects in the past um so he's clearly back he's still doing some comics too but he's clearly working on animation as well so that's a pretty high profile gig for him yeah i remember seeing the name but didn't just didn't put it yep. together but that's, yeah that's wow him. Okay, yeah, yeah. That's pretty cool right yeah because some of the other artwork he had on his uh at New York Comic Con is just absolutely stunning. Oh yeah, yeah, he's yeah. phenomenal for sure. Uh, I was lucky enough to get a, a little quick sketch out of him actually too, so I was I'm very pleased to have that in my collection because he's his artwork is phenomenal. He's also the story is great too. You know, oh yeah, yeah, it's such, so such cool. great. It's very funny as well. Yeah, it's yeah, it's for good, sure. And great characters. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. lots of potential. I hope I hope he does carry it on with those characters. Yeah, I'd like to see I'd like to see more of it as well. Hopefully he will. Um I know right now he's working on a series, another series of graphic novels. He did one on Kickstarter, and I think we're supposed to see more, but I'm guessing that what if probably derailed him for a little while. So Yeah, yeah. But if you get that you get an offer to work for Marvel, you're gonna go for that, aren't you? Yeah, I think so. Especially if you're an animation guy and they want you to animate a show for them, a high profile one too. So yeah, yeah. uh yeah. All right. Well, the good recommendations. I haven't played the game, although I'm intrigued. I'll have to check it out, but definitely I'm a fan of Silver, so nice job. Um, all right, and there you go. So those are our recommendations. Uh, hopefully you guys can check them out, and if you have any recommendations for us, please send them our way. We're always looking for new stuff to, uh, to get into, so don't be afraid to send us things that you're enjoying right now as well. Yep. So, yeah. Anywhere, like Facebook, Twitter, probably the best way is just uh, photos. Let us know your yeah, board yeah. games and things like that. Always good to, to know. Okay. Absolutely. All right. Well, I think that is going to start to wrap us up for this evening's show. This is our last show for the year. Uh, if you're one of our regular viewers and you're kind of thinking in two weeks, unlike December 28th when we record this, like, why aren't we here? It's because we're taking a well-deserved holiday break. Um, so we will be back in early January. We'll kick things off most likely with our top 10 films of 2021, I think, Phil. Does that yeah, sound yeah, good? That's the plan. Yeah, I've still got a few I've got to try and catch up on. But, uh, yep, yep, yep. But I think I'd like to, I think that'll be a fun way to kick things off so we'll be back with that um and of course we would like to say um i think from from phil and myself uh you know very merry christmas and happy holidays to all of you i know it's uh, still a couple of weeks away and or a couple weeks past for some like like hanukkah has already passed but uh whatever holiday you celebrate i hope it's enjoyable and safe and healthy and you have a great time and thank you guys for listening to us all year uh phil anything you'd like to to add yeah just to yeah, have a great time eat Eat, drink, and be merry. Give all those people you love a big hug. Call yep. the people you haven't seen for a while. Uh, 
enjoy opening the presents. Yep. Uh, don't break anything on the first day when you're opening them. Be <laughs> right. careful how you put the stickers right. on. Right. Uh, what else? Yeah. I just, yeah, just have a great time celebrating however you celebrate. Or if you don't celebrate anything, have a good That's day. fine, too. Yeah. 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 Uh, um, have a happy new year. Oh, yeah, that, too. Yeah. Um, and as much grief as I give it, if you want to watch Die Hard this Christmas season, you go right ahead and watch Die Hard. Just don't post about it on the internet. That's all I'm saying. Um, so, but I'll never be grudge. Listen, here's the thing: Die Hard, one of my favorite movies of all time. I'll oh, never be grudge people watching. Such a good it. I don't care why they watch it or when they watch it. Yeah. So enjoy it. It's um, still but I'll be watching up. actual Christmas movies yeah. this season. Yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> all right. On that note, um, yeah. Again, happy holidays to everybody. Thank you again for watching. And uh, we're out of here for the year. We'll be back early next year. So keep your eyes peeled. Uh, I'm Mike Spring. I'm Phil Edwards. And we'll see you next time. After the ending.